1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 to 20. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. From Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 30. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. From Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Verses 1 to 6. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. And verses 13 to 14. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. And Ephesians 1 verses 22 to 23. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Hey everyone, how you doing? Uh, my name's Matt, just in case we haven't had the, uh, the pleasure of, uh, how they say it, making, making our acquaintance. So it's, uh, it's good to have you again with us uh, this morning for our Sunday morning service. Just in case you don't know, I'm continuing uh, a sermon series that we started a while ago now entitled Theology is Not a Dirty Word. Theology is Not a Dirty Word. And um, just like a, a bit of background uh, on that, the reason I entitled it that is that in my experience, so many people, when they hear that word theology, have an almost like instantaneous knee-jerk reaction. So they associate it with academia, with, uh, you know, it, it's dry, it's dusty, it's the realm of usually older men who've got nothing better to do with their time than study theology, um, or they're intimidated by it. They think it's a little bit over their heads, perhaps, and really just completely unrelated to regular everyday life. And the point of this sermon series is to try to point out, in fact, everyone has what you can call a practical theology. So a worldview, if you like, a way that what they believe about the world and about God influences their day to day. So it's eminently practical. And um, I want to take some, I guess, stereotypical theological subjects and unpack them a little bit because I think it's, it makes far more sense to be clear and intentional and conscious about what we believe rather than leaving it kind of kick around in our brains or our subconscious and it's unspoken, it's just kind of assumed, it's not really kind of brought out into the light and discussed. So I'm, I'm a big fan of trying to get clarity on this stuff and kind of point out again how it really, it does, it, it, it relates in very important ways to our everyday lives as individuals and also as a church family. So, um, so that's what I'm trying to kind of, I suppose, get at. Um, I, I want to get clarity on these subjects and I want to avoid the risk of autopilot, if you like. And perhaps the greatest risk of being on a virtual autopilot on any topic is the church the church. So think about this, right? If you're a member of this church and say, for example, you've been attending Sunday services once a month, once a month for the past five years, just imagine that. So that's two hours roughly per service times 12 times five equals, if my maths is right on, about 120 hours, 120 hours you've logged up. That's the equivalent of three 40 hour standard working weeks. And I'd say all that time, that 120 hours, that three working weeks, you're learning what church is. You're learning why we're a part of it. You're learning what church means, all firsthand, all via immersion, if you like. 
And that example assumes that your, that your only involvement, again, is Sunday mornings and only once a month. What about if like lots of people here, perhaps the majority of people here, you were here more frequently, you were here fortnightly. What about if you're part of a small group? What about if you're giving money to the church? What about if you're turning up to working bees and helping out? All these experiences that are related to church are teaching us indirectly, more so than directly, what church is, I'd say, what church is. And what about if this is the only church that you've been a long-term member of? I'd say unless you've done some study, some intentional reading, some watching, some listening, or talking about it, your conception of church, what you think church entails, will be synonymous with how we go about being church here. And maybe you're thinking, well, like, what's the big deal? Church is church. It's pretty simple. I like it. So that's enough for now. That's good. But I still think it's worth thinking about how we think about church for a number of reasons. Thinking about how we think about church for a number of reasons. Um, And one of them, the big one, we want to ensure that we've mined scriptures, we've plunged into into the Bible as much as possible with the assistance and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to discover what God has revealed about church in his word. We want to make sure that we're under the guidance, under the direction, that we're consistent with what we read in scripture. So there's that. Secondly, we can't ignore what you could call the spirit of the age, or if you like, the larger cultural context that we live in, which is going to undoubtedly influence the way even we view church. So as an example, and I don't think I'd be alone in this, I've got plenty of friends who, could, who consider themselves Christians, so they, they identify as Christians, and I believe, them, um, with, I, I believe they're 110% sincere. But they aren't part of a church. They aren't part of a church. And this isn't, again, like, this isn't unusual. Can you be a Christian without belonging to a church is a question I think almost no one asks anymore. The answer is just taken for granted. Because it sounds very judging, if you like, And it downplays the responsibility and rights of the individual and their relationship with God. But the early church and the church fathers, so I guess like the early church leaders, they went in exactly the opposite direction of that current belief. So this is uh, Cyprian, the Bishop of Carthage. I think he was around about 400 AD. And look what he says. He who is not the church for his mother has not God for his father. Wow. That's not very consistent with you do you, right? That's not very, that flies right in the spirit, in the face of the spirit of the age. That's Cyprian. And then you've got St. Augustine, also a fairly heavy hitter in the early church and a big brain, I think it'd be fair to say. Outside the church, there is no salvation. Gee, St. Augustine, what is this, a cult? That's a bit heavy. Come on, man. Outside the church, there is no salvation. So just to be clear, I think you can be a follower of Jesus without being part of a church, or at least I wouldn't want to make the call that you can't be. I don't think it's ideal. I don't think it's particularly healthy. I don't think it's suggested by Scripture. But that's not really the point of this example. The point is that we live in a time when even when the church, the church itself has been devalued, I think. Its importance has been downplayed. And to some degree, we, even members of the church, are influenced by that, because that's the water that we swim in, as a generalisation. And finally on this, why think about how we think about church. If you're a member of this or any other church, I think you owe it to yourselves to find out more about it. Because again, you spend time, you probably spend copious amounts of time involved in church. You invest emotional energy into church and relationships. You also give financially as well, right? Like you will give, don't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. So you're probably giving financially as well. So in all these different ways, like you are expending yourself in, in something that could be directed somewhere else. So I think given all that, why not find out more about it? Why not find out more about what it is that we do and why we do it? Why not think about how we think about church? So there are some reasons why I think it's worth examining this subject. And as I said at the start, our experiences of church will very likely colour our view of it. What we're used to doing and being part of, so, so can, it can so easily 
become the only way that it can be done right. That's the risk. The way we've always done it, the way I'm used to it, becomes just the way of course. It's the only way to do it. So today, I'm aiming for two things by the end of this. Again, I want to get us thinking about how we think about church, and I want to at least begin to explain how, how important, how central church is to God via those scriptures primarily that we heard read out at the start. Um, this is uh, obviously this is just the start of a couple of talks that we're going to do on this. It's an immensely, um, I suppose, comprehensive and large subject. So please don't think that I'm going to try to cover everything today. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I've talked about how our own church experiences can colour, how we go about um, thinking church should operate. So to put my cards on the table, so you guys know where I'm, uh, where I'm coming from, uh, I was raised in a Brethren background church, much like this, uh, up in Burnie, except there were a few more beards around back then. Um, I was baptised in a Presbyterian church, so I was sprinkled. I worked for the Reformed Church briefly. I helped start an emerging style church that met in houses and pubs. I came back to a Brethren background church, this one, and I currently study at an Anglican Theological College. So I'm pretty hard to please, really. There's just no pleasing me. But on the upside, hopefully those experiences have led to a fairly, if you like, broad view, a relatively broad view. So let's start proper. First, some definitions. What is church? So this one's by a theologian called Greg Allison. Um, I liked. Um, this came up in some of my studies. Church is the people of God who have been saved through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ and have been incorporated into his body through baptism in the Holy Spirit. Um, I like that for a number of reasons. You'll see there, you've got the Trinity for what it's worth. God the Father, so God, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, all there involved in church right from the get-go. Uh, similar to this is another definition from uh, an Aussie theologian, Mike Bird, a lot more simple. Concise church is the people of God under the new covenant. Um, and again, that is similar to what we see. So these are you know, recent, like the last couple of years. If you go all the way back to the 4th century, century onwards, the Apostles' Creed, again, so this is what they were using 400, uh, 400 AD. Church is the communion of saints, if you like. The holy universal Catholic is a universal church, the communion of saints. So in all these, again, just three little snapshot definitions, you see some common elements, right? And a big one is the emphasis on people, on people. And again, particularly in that first definition, the emphasis on the different members of the Trinity, the Godhead, they're all involved, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So some commonalities right off the bat, but it's about people. It's a people, primarily. Also, church can mean two different but interconnected things. You've got the universal church. So this has been in existence from the book of Acts and will continue until the return of Christ. It's universal in the sense that it involves Christians all through history, all through history, both the living and the dead. Um, I think another term that I think was popular back in the day was the church triumphant the church triumph of the universal church or church with a big C. But then there's the local church, church with a small C, a visible and specific expression of the universal church, a church like ours, made up pre uh, presumably of the living, if you like. Um, another term that used to get thrown around for this was the church militant, but I think in uh, the recent focus groups they've run on that, it doesn't get so much good press anymore, <laughs> the church militant. So we can just call it like the local church, the local church. So you can see the overlap there. The local church is part of the universal church, but the universal church is so much bigger in so many ways. We here in this room are actually and importantly connected into something far bigger than what we see. So we've got brothers and sisters just down, literally just down the road here in Margate, but also all around the world, all around the world. And we belong to something that has long preceded us and may well live, outlive us as well. You know, we're just something, there's a stream that goes this way and that way. And that's kind of cool, I think. Like that's, that's pretty exciting. So there's that. But first big question, given all that. So I looked at a couple of definitions. We've broken it down a little bit into universal and local, but it still begs this question. Where do we get all this information from about church? Where do we look to, if you like, for our definitions, our boundaries, our parameters as to what constitutes a church? Or where do we go to work out how we set up and organize a church? Again, we may just take all this stuff for granted, or we may assume that all of it, the way we do it, is all found in the Bible and everyone agrees on that. But it's just not that simple. There are 
different ways to answer that question. Okay, so that question, where do we go to find out the information about church? Where do we go to learn how to organize church? So three, three different answers. And here they are. The first one is that scripture is wholly sufficient, is wholly sufficient. Everything that you need to know about the church, everything you need to know about the church is contained in the Bible. That includes leadership models and how you actually go about organizing and governing a church. It's all there. It's all there in scripture. My understanding is that this is how the Presbyterians operate. This is one of the things that make Presbyterians Presbyterian. Their church leadership and governance models, it's all in the Bible. And my guess is that this is also how most churches with our background, who belong to our network, also operate. Our leadership model comes from scripture. Now, of course, the slightly disconcerting thing about this is that our way of doing things doesn't really look that much like the Presbyterians and vice versa. Maybe we're both right. Maybe we're both right. So that's one way of looking at how do we go about organizing and being church? What are the parameters? Scripture is wholly sufficient. The second answer is to say, no, Scripture, the Bible, it's not sufficient. The Bible by itself isn't enough. So here is where I think you find, say, um, the Roman Catholics who look both to Scripture and holy tradition, and they view both those sources equally. But here's also where you have new and old independent churches who either rely on traditions, if you like, to kind of govern and direct the church, or they have direct voices or revelations from God, but only the leadership here. And they, they'll hold to those even when they contradict the Bible. And it's important to note that in, in any case, that will say that either tradition or the, or the revelation of the voices from God, they're all examples of divine revelation, right? So it's God revealing himself to his people in a way that has equal authority with Scripture. Their origins aren't human. I don't think we hold to this view of church. So there, if you like, two ends of the spectrum. And then we have the third. And the third view is that scripture, the Bible, is sufficient in areas for which it aims to be sufficient. Does that make sense? Scripture is sufficient for the aims, the areas in which it aims to be sufficient. So when it comes to the basics and fundamentals of church, Jesus is Lord, we're a community that is indwelt and empowered by the Holy Spirit. We observe communion and baptism, we can look, you know, for all those basics, we can look to the Bible and say, that's the ultimate authority. But when it comes to, again, that example particularly of how the church is organized, how it's led, how it's governed, we need to look to other sources because the Bible was never really concerned with that level of detail. You see, that? that's the big point. The Bible was never concerned with that level of detail. So why would you go to the Bible and look to that for being the authority? So for example, I believe that the Anglicans, they have it recorded in one of their ordinances that they look to both Holy Scripture and ancient authors. That is, some of the early church fathers. And they look to both those sources in order to arrive at the conclusion that churches should have deacons, priests, and bishops. So they don't get that, they don't get that church governance structure purely from Scripture because, again, their take is that Scripture doesn't address that issue in that level of detail. Um, it's probably pretty obvious. I find this stuff really interesting. But, uh, but hopefully it goes beyond that. Hopefully it goes beyond that. Because you can see, and I think this is really important, you can see that the boundaries you draw up around how we're going to try to figure out what church is, those boundaries really matter. Because they can lead to quite different looking local churches. Make sense? doesn't seem like a big deal until you start to see the variety in different church expressions and denominations and networks, et cetera, et cetera. And these differences don't come down, like that, 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 they, they don't come out of nowhere. They come from these very much core beliefs. Where do we go to when it comes to setting up and establishing what constitutes a church? What, what is our final authority going to be on that? This stuff matters. Okay. Let's say we just keep it simple and we look to the Bible to find out what church is. What is church? Okay, that sounds simple enough. So we can go back to the definitions like the ones that I gave before to help us get a handle on it. Or we can go, we can go from the English word that's translated into church in the English, back to the New Testament Greek term, which a lot of you would be uh, familiar with, ecclesia. And this is only somewhat helpful, I think, because it really means, it means an assembly, it means a congregation of people that are called out for something. 
but it wasn't in the New Testament Greek a particularly religious term. Okay, so it wasn't just applied to churches or even religious groups. It could like apply to like a town hall meeting kind of thing. There was an ecclesia of people that were all kind of pulled out and set apart for this town hall meeting. Yeah, so even that is kind of limited in terms of helping our understanding of what church is. And so if you're just going on this and those definitions, what we think about church can actually seem pretty thin. It's not very rich. It's not very comprehensive. So I want to offer three perspectives. None of these are uh, originally from me, not my ideas. They come from, again, the work of that Greg Allison uh, theologian. Really helpful perspectives. And these, I think, help, help their lenses, if you like. They help us understand what church is, how to view church. So we've looked at how you go about defining it, how do I draw the boundaries around how to define it, and now we're looking at three different ways at what constitutes church. And if it helps, these are just, I think, very similar to three different ways that we can view people as well. So here they are, the first way. The first way. The first way um, you can call, if you want to be fancy pants about it, the ontological way. That's right, five syllables. The ontological way of looking at church. And this way of looking at the church wants to get at the church's ontology. That is its nature, its qualities. If you have an idea of what constitutes the nature of someone, you'll have a good idea or something, you'll know what its functions are. So a simpler way of looking at it is this view is concerned with who are we as a church? What's a church? Who are we? we start with who we are. If you go back to the early church and the creed, so their foundational beliefs, this is what they're really concerned about when it comes to defining the church. So what is the church? They'd say, all the way back then, the church is a holy, unified, universal group of Jesus followers who follow his teachings as passed on by the apostles. That's probably something like they'd say. That's the church. So it's more who we are, if you like, rather than what we do or where we're going. So... You could say the equivalent would be, this is Fred. Fred is a kind and empathetic kid who's naturally curious. He's the brother to Harold, and he's the son of Dawn and Sylvester. Who's Fred? That's Fred. That's his qualities, that's his essence, that's his relationships. That's one way of looking at the church, who we are. So this way of looking at it is probably the most philosophical and probably the least common these days. It doesn't sound that exciting, uh, it makes me think of the band Roxette's greatest hits album entitled Don't Bore Us, Get to the Chorus, Get to the Good Stuff, which if you want to borrow, I know at least one person in this congregation would have a copy of. <laughs> so the second way of looking at church is what you call a functional way. So this is the kind of more traditional exciting stuff. So it's the functional way of looking at church. What's the church? It's our ministries. It's our, it's our activities. It's what we do. So who are we? We seek a sensitive. We're purpose-driven. We're based around small groups. We're external looking and concerned with social justice. Church is primarily about what we do. So going back to Fred. Fred goes to primary school. He also goes to youth group like once a fortnight. He loves fishing. That's Fred. It's what he does. That's what he does. And then there's the third way of looking at church, which again, if you want to get, yeah, um, which you could simply say, the church is really concerned about where it's going, its end, its final purpose. And where's that? We'd say the kingdom of God. So what's a church? A, ch a church is a group of people who are following the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations, and they're living out the Sermon on the Mount, and they're praying for God's kingdom to come. So the church in that sense started in Acts 1.8, when Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit coming down on them, and we're headed to Revelation 21.22. That's our glorious end. So how do you define the church? It's where we're going. This is Fred, and one day Fred's going to be a fantastic guitarist. And so right now he practices every day, and he plays in a couple of really cool bands. That's Fred. That's where he said he's going to be a great guitarist one day. Does that make sense? Three different views, three different ways of looking at what the church is. So I hope you found, again, this interesting, but again, more importantly, I hope you found it useful. Because I think all these views are both borne out in Scripture, you find them in the Bible, and they're all really useful. They're all needed. Some commentators, they prize one of these views over the others. But regardless, I'd say we've all got our built-in biases and blind spots. My trap, for example, is to become preoccupied by the second one, what we do at the expense of the first, who we are. So I can get caught up in the ministries, the activities, and I forget who we are already. And that's risky, 
because probably now more so than ever, church life can become way too pragmatic. Whatever works, man, if it works, just do it. And then we forget our true identities. We're part of the family of God. And then if we forget who we really are, we can become mercenary. We start mistreating people. We use people as means as opposed to an ends. And we can risk throwing people under the church bus. Or in forgetting who we are, we compromise and we capitulate. Instead of being a light to the world, we end up resembling it far, far, far too much. So if you don't remember anything else from the sermon, please don't forget who we are, first and foremostly, who we are as a church. Okay, so to wrap it up, I wanted just to finish on these verses that I read at the start of the service. They're a reminder of the magnitude and the scope of what we're part of. The church, according to those verses, it's not an afterthought in the mind of God. It was never God's plan B. So again, looking at those verses, you'll see in Ephesians, Paul writes, and again, he's not writing so much to individuals, he's writing to local churches just like ours. He's writing that um, we, the people of God, were chosen before the creation of the world. That's before the Garden of Eden. That's before the fall in Genesis chapter 3. And in verse 22, which I think is the next one, yeah, in verse 22, the church is referred to as Christ's body, his fullness. Again, it's just so easy to downplay the importance of it these days, to focus on its many flaws or reduce church just to a human-created institution. But as we'll see over the next couple of months, the church is God's primary, so not exclusive, not only, but God's primary way of operating in the world. Some theologians say it's the kingdom of God viewed from the perspective of the not yet. That's how important they see the church. Again, it's a complicated topic, the relationship with the kingdom of God and the church. We'll come back to that later. But that's how some people view it. This side of eternity and the kingdom coming, it's the kingdom of God in the not yet. And as Paul writes in Romans... God foreknew us and is conforming us to the image of Christ and incorporating us into his family, brothers and sisters. So he says there about Jesus, he's the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So again, right from the get-go, it was all about creating a people, if you like, a family, no less. So God values the church. It's core to his purpose and plan for all of history. It expresses the fullness of his son. It demonstrates another way to live, as we read in 1 Peter, as opposed to the empty way of life that we can so easily fall into. Sometimes we can maybe lose sight of the universal church, the church triumphant. We can lose sight of those who have gone before us. We can lose sight of those who are around us, you know, different networks, different churches. We can lose sight of all the good the church has done in God's power through history. And instead, instead, we can get understandably frustrated by the visible church's failings, its frustrations, so this talk is really meant to be an encouragement. It's a big, often complicated topic and a frustrating reality at the same time. But we're part of something here. Even at MCC, we're really part of something that has been in place and part of God's plans and purpose since before creation. That's amazing. That should be comforting. That should be encouraging. So to pull it all together this week, please, if you have the time and the inclination, just think about what is church. Mull it over, pray about it, talk to some people about it. I'd encourage you not to take it for granted. I'd encourage you not to kind of just take the way you've always thought about it as the way that it has to be. We've all got stereotypes of church. We've all got preconceptions. We've all had various different kinds of experiences in different churches. And all that can color, if you like, what we think church should be. It can influence how we think about church. But I'd, again, encourage you to rethink it. Because whether it's history, all these different theological lenses, church is so broad, it is so wide. If anything, our risk is that our view of church, it is too narrow, it's too constrained, it's too small. It's too small. So please think about that over the next couple of weeks. And please be encouraged. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for uh, we thank you for your church. Uh, we thank you for uh, the bride of Christ. We thank you for um, your son's body. And I pray, um, like we've talked about and read about and heard about, Father, I pray that we won't take this for granted. Um, I pray that we won't uh, remain, if you like, uh, within our preconceived ideas, um, our, just our, our notions that have kind of become, I suppose, just um, the way we think about church through time and experience. 
I pray that uh, if need be, you'll cause us to think more and more broadly about what church is and, uh, and what a treasure it is, Father. And um, I pray that you help us be encouraged by the fact that we aren't a, a person, a, a, a human created institution, but we are um, a people that you've brought together, that you've planned way, way, way before the creation of the world, and that you've infused with your Holy Spirit to empower, Father. And I pray that we will draw encouragement and inspiration from that as we try to be little pockets of your kingdom here on earth. Amen.